By the time of his death in 2015, Singapore's founding father, Lee Kuan Yew, had won widespread respect as the architect of the city-state's prosperity. But he'd also been accused of restricting freedom of speech and repressing political opposition. Now his complex legacy is under scrutiny amid a bitter family dispute and growing calls for greater democracy. We've been to find out why. It's one of Asia's richest cities, a modern metropolis, safe, orderly and business friendly. Often described as an economic miracle, tiny Singapore has no hinterland and few natural resources. When the former British colony became an independent nation in 1965, there were even doubts about its survival. To take ourselves within less than one generation from a developing country to one of the most developed countries in the world, you know, we have to be grateful for Mr. Lee Kuan Yew for having this far-sighted vision. It will be prudent for us in East Asia to have Europe as a full partner. To talk about Singapore's success is to talk about its first Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew. Adored by many, abhorred by some, LKY, as he is often referred to, was as controversial as he was visionary. He does loom larger than life. A lot of the story Singapore tells itself is wrapped up with my grandfather, and a lot of the story the world has about Singapore is wrapped up with him. Although he's a very rough and tough man, but he gives you that confidence that I get things done. You may not like it, never mind but this is the way things should be happening. When Lee died in 2015, an estimated one and a half million Singaporeans turned up to say their final goodbyes. Most were ordinary people, grateful for what they said were the contributions of a great man. Later that same year, the ruling People's Action Party, co-founded by Lee Kuan Yew and in power since 1959, won nearly 70% of the vote in general elections, giving Lee's son, Singapore's current Prime Minister, Lee Hsien Loong, a resounding mandate. We've had a good 50 years. We must go forward now to make the next journey just as fulfilling, just as successful, just as amazing to the world and to ourselves. Two years on, the mood is markedly less upbeat. Singaporeans have long been told that they live in a meritocracy run by the very best minds. That perception is now being challenged in unexpected ways. On the 14th of June 2017, a curious post started circulating on Facebook titled A Public Statement by Li Wei Ling and Li Xian Yang, we have no confidence in PM Li Xian Long and are worried about Singapore's future, it was the opening salvo in what some are calling the Oxley feud. At the centre of the quarrel, this house, a colonial era bungalow on Oxley Road, just off Singapore's shopping district, this is where Li Kuan Yew lived for nearly seven decades and where he raised his family. He had repeatedly said he wanted it demolished after his death. Now, according to Lee's younger children, their brother, Singapore's Prime Minister, was doing all he could to preserve the property. My father and aunt were very reluctant about going public. The fact that they took that step was because they felt very much sort of forced into a corner like all the you know, various arms of government were being arrayed against them and, you know, that if they kept quiet, they would have seen essentially a careful dismantling of my grandfather's last wish. In an astonishing series of Facebook posts, Li Xianyang and Li Wei Ling 
accused their brother, the Prime Minister, of misleading their own father. Even more disturbing, they said he'd abused executive power in a bid to preserve the house at Oxley Road. And they alleged that their brother and his wife wanted to milk Li Kuan Yu's legacy because they harbored political ambitions for their son, Li Hong Yi. The simple answer is that I didn't deceive my father. I explained to you yesterday how my father's primary wish on the house has always been clear. He always wanted it knocked down. Where my siblings and I differ is on whether my father was prepared to consider alternatives should demolition not be possible. In early July, the Singapore Parliament cleared Li Xianlong of any wrongdoing after a two-day hearing. At the time, his People's Action Party held 83 out of the 89 elected seats here. Both the Prime Minister's office and Li Hongyi declined our requests for comment. But on Facebook, Hongyi posted, For what it's worth, I really have no interest in politics. The thing about not being interested is you can remain uninterested until you become interested. If he didn't want to be in politics, he could have said things a lot more clearly and in a way that would be, you know, at least a little bit difficult to walk back. We're spending the day with Li Sheng Wu in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're near Elliot House now. You know, my family has a repeated history with Elliot House. When my grandfather was on sabbatical, he stayed at Elliot House. When my uncle was doing the thing at the Kennedy School, he stayed at Elliot House. Now I have dinners at Elliot House every Monday. It's the, you know, it's my one work obligation. An economist at Harvard University, Sheng Wu was in Singapore on holiday when he found himself in the crosshairs of the Oxley feud. The catalyst was a post on his Facebook page in which he described Singapore's court system as pliant. It was visible only to his friends, but someone he's not sure who, took a screenshot, which was quickly shared online. The government demanded a retraction and apology. Sheng Wu refused, and prosecutors have since commenced contempt proceedings against him. He's agreed to meet us today on condition we not talk about the case. Instead, we discuss his grandfather's legacy. There are two histories we could be telling ourselves 20 years from now. There's a history where we say that my grandfather made a great contribution to Singapore's development, helped make it become a modern society with sort of professional, unimpeachable government. His legacy would be that, uh, you know, unlike many models of sort of independence leaders who were big personalities, right, that he would have managed to create sort of good institutions that would outlast him. And there's a model, you know, 20 years from now, where we look back on Singapore and say, this is just one more country where it had a good leader, and there are lots of early independence leaders who did great things for their country, and it's still circling the orbit of what used to be. I worry that in the years to come, the government won't have the courage to step away from relying on his legacy. Sheng Wu now lives in a self-imposed exile. He says he has no plans to go back to Singapore and no desire to be involved in politics. It's valuable in Singapore that there be a transition away from the family brand name. I'm not sure why my grandfather chose his own son and was willing to have his own son go into politics and be prime minister. Uh, but all I can say is there are a lot of human beings, you know, if there's one person in the world you're going to overestimate, it's your own child. Across the world, another Singaporean is also trying to live a quiet life away in a self-imposed exile. Roy Ng moved to Taiwan's capital, Taipei, a year and a half ago. Few people here know it, but he was once an activist and opposition politician who ran and lost in Singapore's general elections in 2015. 
Right. After the election, it was actually quite difficult to look for a job. Um, you know, big international companies wouldn't employ me as well. Um, so at that point, I, I mean, one, one of it is for life, my livelihood. I needed to earn a living, and it was difficult to do so. The PAP cannot take our CPF, our retirement funds. Ng mm, caught the public's attention when he started writing and speaking about Singapore's Central Provident Fund, or CPF, a mandatory savings scheme for working adults. Is it right for the PAP to make us use our hard-earned money to pay them for their salaries to give us so little back for our CPF? In May 2014, shortly before this protest, Li Xianlong sued him for defamation over a blog post and Ng was sacked from his job at a public hospital. Return our CPF! Return our CPF! The Prime Minister's lawyer said he had insinuated that Li Xianlong was guilty of criminally misappropriating CPF funds. All I was concerned about was to talk about the pension funds, how people are not being able to, you know, how people are not able to live fair, equal livelihoods. And I just want to talk about that. The, the lawsuit was a complete distraction. He lost, and the court awarded the Prime Minister damages and costs totaling some 136,000 US dollars. Ng is paying in instalments and won't be free of debt until 2033. It's clear he's struggling to come to terms with all that's happened. If you don't live in Singapore, you don't understand the fear. You don't understand the, what it does to your brain. It don't, it, you don't understand the cognitive dissonance you have to go through. So sometimes when I put the question to people, I tell them, uh, you know, they say they're not scared. And I say, OK, fine, will you challenge the government? And they're like, mm. <laughs> so that means you're scared. It's no secret. Singaporeans do not enjoy many of the liberties citizens in most first world nations take for granted. The Economist Intelligence Unit classifies the country as a flawed democracy, and it is ranked 151st out of 180 countries on the Reporters Without Borders Press Freedom Index. There's just one place where public protests are allowed. Speaker's Corner, a field near the city centre surrounded by surveillance cameras. We were playing the usual game at the back there. Who spot the policeman? <laughs> Some activists have gathered today for a silent protest to mark International Human Rights Day. For most Singaporeans, the occasion is a non-event. The kinds of Western political freedoms that uh, the Western media, for example, likes to talk about are not things that the majority of Singaporeans value anyway. Prosperity can be achieved without having to follow a Western political system. There's another school of thought, though, that says most Singaporeans are too scared to care. Retired lawyer and activist Tio So Lung still remembers the night 30 years ago when police came for her. I never saw myself as a threat to the PAP, and I never saw myself as having the ability to lead people to go and uh, confront uh, 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 the government. Even when I was arrested, I just couldn't believe it. She was held for more than two years without trial, rounded up along with 21 other Singaporeans in a crackdown codenamed Operation Spectrum. The government said they were part of a Marxist conspiracy. <laughs> The notion that there was ever a conspiracy has been widely discredited, but it would be more than two decades before these former detainees dared to speak publicly about their experiences. They assaulted me. They really beat me up till I uh, had to give in and, and said, OK, if you want to say that I'm a Marxist, then I'm a Marxist. Operation Spectrum had a great deal of impact on civil society. Civil society was just re-emerging. The government saw it coming, and they didn't want civil society to grow. Few Singaporean activists expect a repeat of Operation Spectrum. 
but there remains very little room for dissent. Last October, police arrested artist Silan Palais when he stood in front of parliament as part of a performance in honor of former parliamentarian Chia Tai Po, who was imprisoned without trial for 23 years. Under Singaporean law, just one person can constitute an illegal assembly. If you did what I did in most other countries, especially as an artwork, right, not even a, like a demonstration, I think most people just leave you alone. My intention was to perform the work, and then if unjust laws get in the way of the realization of it, then that's, that's not really my problem. Yeah, that's the state's issue that it has to deal with itself. Palais was released after a day in custody. But if he is charged and found guilty, he faces a fine and up to six months in prison. Former PAP Member of Parliament Tan Cheng Bok says Lee Kuan Yew believed such draconian measures were necessary. I remember Lee Kuan Yew once said you have to have that during his time, huh, you need fear to get things done. In 2011, Tan surprised his former party when he ran for president, narrowly losing to a candidate backed by the PAP. President! The president's role is largely ceremonial, but he or she can, in certain situations, prevent the government from drawing on Singapore's reserves. He or she also approves key public service appointments. Many Singaporeans are waiting to, to get somebody to ask those questions. What is our reserve strength? Whether we have any losses? Who is, who is uh, putting his finger into this reserve? Uh, I think most important also is the appointments, you know. How do you appoint people? Very important. Do you appoint people based on friendship? As a president, I wouldn't allow that. His plans to stand again in 2017 were thwarted when the government changed the rules, reserving that year's election for candidates from the Malay race and tightening requirements for those hoping to throw their hat in the ring. The government explained the decision as necessary for minority representation. But the move sparked a rare protest, with hundreds of Singaporeans showing up at Speaker's Corner to express their displeasure. In the end, only one candidate qualified to stand. Former House Speaker and PAP Member of Parliament, Halima Yaakob. Why not have free and fair elections? Because the PAP does not have the confidence that it can actually win a free and fair election. What it shows really is the very short-termism of the PAP. It shows their fear of transparency, their fear of people actually having uh, a voice, a say, you know, their, their fear of giving up even a tiny iota of power. Um, articles published Monday, Thursday. Tum divides his time between coordinating a program on Southeast Asian studies at Oxford University and managing an online publication and think tank in Singapore. So, any questions, pain points? What do you not like the most? Yes. Um, can I ask, like, how are you guys One of his goals is to get Singaporeans to be less afraid to speak up. But he knows it won't be easy. He too has been penalised for doing so. I used to work for the National University of Singapore and after I started publishing and giving lectures about my research which proved that Lee Kuan Yew had lied about his use of detention without trial um, from the 1960s onwards, um, I was privately informed um, by someone senior in the university that I would never be able to work uh, in Singapore as an academic, as part of the formal academic system again. <laughs> the People's Action Party agreed and then changed its mind about having a representative speak to us. But we've managed to contact some of its more active supporters. Once you receive the certificate, you're volunteer for life. <laughs> Patrick Liu is a long-time grassroots leader. 
And I look at Singapore, all the fundamentals are really very sound. We have in many countries, governments are in gridlock, selling out even their own country and countrymen so that they will be able to achieve their own personal as well as their own party's objectives. But I think if you look at the governance that we have set up in Singapore, to say that there's no check and balance is not completely correct. I think we do have a group of leaders, even though they serve under the same political parties, they are willing to stand up to voice up their concerns, sometimes not uh, in public, sometimes not in the parliament, but behind closed doors. But even among staunch party supporters, the Oxley feud and the controversy surrounding the elected presidency have been a test of faith. I will not deny that people will be shaken by what have done last year. The trust to the government is shaken. But we must always remember, why is the policy made? There must be a reason. We have to be patient about it. And I have trust in the party, in the ruling party. The only opposition party with seats in parliament declined to speak to us. So we're spending time today with the Singapore Democratic Party. It's kind of encouraging, yeah, we've had a couple of very good conversations. We've had the usual people scared of us, but uh, otherwise I think it's uh, pretty good. No, we're not going to film you, don't worry. Paul Tambia ran and lost here in 2015. Right. He's pressing on, but remains realistic about his chances for success. If you were to win this area, this become maybe... Yeah, correct, it'll disappear. That's right, no. they can gerrymander the thing anyway. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You're up against the PAP juggernaut, and they make use of all the resources available to them. They have all the mainstream media, but ultimately, you know, um, I'm pretty sure that uh, this thing is not sustainable. The, the kind of uh, monolithic sort of one-party ideology is not sustainable. Good morning, Miss. So nice to meet you. She's in Joanna from the SDP. It's a belief his colleague has held on to for decades now. So sorry to bother you on a Sunday morning. How are you? Chi Sun Juan has been arrested, jailed, sued and bankrupted for his political activities. Uh, He's never won an election. Especially in a system like we have in Singapore, it's still very autocratic. People are still very fearful. I've heard countless uh, times where people have said, you know, we, we wanted to vote for the opposition for you, but, you know, we're not sure if, if our votes can be traced back. And we try to assure them there's absolutely nothing to fear because your vote is absolutely secret. Help us spread the word. Join our Facebook, please. I think that Singapore would be better off if there was a robust presence of the opposition in Parliament. That there be enough competition that, you know, the, the ruling party doesn't feel like it can do whatever it likes. We meet Li Sheng Wu again in Hong Kong, two days before the new year. He's spending a somewhat surreal holiday away from home. I don't know exactly how much uh, the government keeps trying to surveil my family, but this is probably the first Christmas where I've made Christmas plans with the family, uh, sort of over-encrypted messaging. When I see my parents outside of Singapore, right, I feel a sense of relief uh, that they are not there. Uh, and that's a very odd thing to feel about home. Li Kuan Yu believed in the power of fear. But now, members of his own family are too afraid to go back to the country he worked so hard to build. My grandfather always worried about having the family together, but he also worried about the persistence of Singapore's institutions. I, I, I just don't know, you know, looking both at what's happened to the family and what's happened in Singapore's institutions, I just don't know what would have caused him more grief.